Hey guys, welcome to another Caternix Corner Live. Um, glad to see everyone checking in over in the chat room. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, with us today is Michael from Southwest Game Words. Welcome, Michael. Hi, Terry. Um, Southwest Game Birds is a partner farm for the JMF lines, um, and Michael's going to be talking uh, with us today about what it takes uh, to be an authorized JMF breeder uh, slash seller and what is required of him um, in order to, you know, to keep those lines clean, uh, to be able to say that he is a, a JMF uh, seller. Um, I'm really excited about this one today, guys, um, because I believe that breeders need to be selling clean bloodlines, especially the pharaohs. Um, it drives me nuts when I order pharaoh eggs and I hatch out birds you know, with white patches on their chest or white primary feathers. Um, it's just not a clean bloodline. So. I'm really excited for this one today. Uh, we did just post a video today, uh, this morning, um, by Allie from Maine's Confetti Quail Farm. Um, in that video, she talks about uh, breeding true or hatching true. And uh, if you didn't see that yet, check it out. Uh, kind of clears up, you know, some of the misconceptions and whatnot of breeding true or hatching true. Um, for those of you guys who are on the Caternix Corner Facebook group page, you may have seen some of the new wire cages um, that I've been putting together. Um, I'm just about got that wrapped up, so there will be a video coming out hopefully this week. So keep an eye out for that one. Um, today we are going to give away a Caternix Corner tumbler uh, to the person who asked the most engaging question of our guest. And Verna's going to be selecting the winners for that. Uh, Verna is in the house as our moderator. Appreciate it, Verna. Uh, Michael, you want to announce your giveaway? Uh, sure. So we're going to do a 120 count box of our salt and pepper production mix. And what that is is a mixture of our JMF production lines. And those are what I'll talk about uh, in just a few minutes. OK, perfect. Um, okay, um, yeah, and you guys, uh, like I say, Verna's going to select the winners for that. So, Verna, we're going to need a winner for the tumbler. We're also going to need a winner for the uh, hatching eggs for Michael. And uh, that's going to go to the person who impresses Verna with the best questions of, questions of the night. So, get your questions in. And if you guys don't mind, uh, type the letter Q in front of your questions. Just helps me find the questions a little bit easier. Um, let's see, I think that's about it. Oh guys, as far as next week goes, I'm not 
sure if I'll be going live. I may have other obligations on Tuesday. I won't know yet, probably until close to this weekend. Uh, but if I'm not going to be going live, I will post it over there on the Facebook group page. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Michael and uh, let him tell you about his JMF lines and what it takes to, to keep that line going. Go ahead, Michael. All right. Thank you, Terry. Thanks for having me on again. Yep. Um, so first of all, when breeding quail, um, it's important to know it's not a developed industry. It's not like chickens where you have uh, a segmented market with companies devoted to each step of the breeding process. Uh, chickens have a complex um, double hybrid crossing <laughs> method for maintaining different bloodlines. And um, oh, we got a little interruption. Hold on. What do you got? This is our newest employee. Oh, cool. Oh, I love the I love the shirt or the what do they call those things? That is the his company onesie. Yeah, the company onesie. That's we cool. make all the we make all the employees wear them. So <laughs> that's so cool. So that's our uh, six month old son James. Soon to be. Um, he'll be running the farm someday. Yep. Yep. Give him a give him three or four years. So um. Uh, anyway, uh, so in the quail industry, it's not nearly as developed. It's kind of like. Uh, raising heritage chicken breeds uh, like Jersey Giants or, or Orpingtons if you were to breed those intensively for meat. Um, so what we do is we work with James Marie Farms uh, and a few other farms to work with them as well uh, to maintain and distribute his bloodlines. And uh, these lines have been in the U.S. for uh, 50 plus years. The first one was developed in the 70s and he's been maintaining them ever since. Uh, whenever there's an opportunity to get a uh, more impressive bloodline, um, he's imported them, he's uh, crossed them to see what takes and what improves certain things in those bloodlines and just over the years uh, refined it, improved it um, into really a nice little workhorse. Um, and they're very consistent, uh, very nice lines. Um, but uh, as I'll discuss later, it's very easy to mess them up within just a few generations if you don't breed them properly. So uh, I think what I'll start with is uh, just some general information on breeding for eggs. Um, when you're breeding a bloodline for egg production, uh, there's kind of three, three key areas that you have to focus on. One is uh, environment, uh, the other is nutrition, and the other is genetics. Um, and uh, proper husbandry practices go into um, the first two of these. Uh, when you're looking at the environment of the chick, uh, if they don't have the proper temperature, uh, if they don't stay clean, have good quality air, good quality water, feed, um, and everything that they need to grow and thrive, um, then the results you get with the grown bird are not really going to be indicative of that bird's genetics. Uh, it'll be stunted in various ways, and so you really don't know what you're working with if the bird wasn't raised properly. So step one is raising the birds properly um, and just not cutting corners um, and making sure that they're always looked after properly. Uh, something interesting about a quail, because it's so small and has such a fast metabolism, um, a quail that runs out of food for um, a day and a half, um, even as little as 12 hours, uh, can be the same as a chicken chick running out of food for several days. Uh, so it really just stresses their system. Uh, they begin depleting their fat reserves almost immediately and then their muscle reserves, uh, and it's really hard on them. Uh, it's the same if they run out of water. With older chicks, uh, you notice they're a lot more violent if they run out of food or water. Um, within about 30 hours, uh, they'll start cannibalizing each other. Um, a thirsty chick uh, will see uh, what's called the gleam in another chick's eye. It looks kind of like the surface of water and it'll peck at that. And then if it bleeds, it'll peck at the blood because it's thirsty. Uh, it's not that the bird's being horrible to the other bird, although that is the end result. Um, uh, but that's really something that can be addressed most of the time with proper husbandry, just giving them constant access to food and water, but also the type of food and water that they need. If the bird is on a cheap starter feed, like a lot of folks uh, eat quail do more chicken starter feed, um, it's the same as starving your bird. It's, it's going to be hungry, it's not going to grow as quickly, and you're going to see more of those aggressive tendencies that are similar to not giving the bird food at all. 
Uh, so Purina has normally been the gold standard for Gamebird feed. And if you have another feed that you prefer, uh, if you have a local feed or an organic feed or something like that, um, we always encourage people compare it to Purina, make sure your birds perform just as well as they would on that. Um, and I, I'm not saying there aren't better feeds, uh, there very well may be, um, but just make sure that it's at least giving the bird what it needs. Um, the last thing when you're raising and maintaining these bloodlines is never, ever, ever to mix them. So if you mix uh, one bloodline with another, if you have brooders and you're raising two types of birds and you don't keep them separated properly, uh, it can be almost impossible to differentiate them until it's too late. So this is something that is just a standard every good breeder should practice. If you're not sure what chick you're looking at, you can't use it, it's not useful. Um, it's certainly not useful for any type of brand name uh, line like a JMF line uh, that's sold for its productive capabilities. So that's uh, some general advice for raising for eggs. Um, quick spiel on meat. Uh, raising the birds for meat, exact same process as far as environment and nutrition. Uh, very important to grow them outright. Um, raising for meat is more difficult because everyone wants a really large quail. Um, and quail have a natural ability to lay large eggs compared to their body size, but they have a natural wall where you just can't raise them above a certain weight um, without running into all kinds of issues. So uh, geneticists compare it to uh, something that happened with butterball turkeys, where the turkeys were raised to be so large that they actually collapsed from their own weight. So their bones were dislocated, they would have slipped tendons, um, and they would just kind of lay on the on the ground because they couldn't walk. Um, they had bred those birds to be so productive at putting on muscle mass, um, but it, it wasn't good for the overall health of the bird. So we call it the butterball wall, is how big a bird can get um, for its genetics. And with the JMF lines, that wall is right at about 15 ounces. So in our breeding program, if a bird exceeds 15 ounces, it's not even included in the breeding program, it's cult. So most folks have trouble getting birds large, and that is the most difficult thing to do initially, but it's also important to realize what the maximum capability of a bloodline is so that you can keep it healthy generation after generation. So um, second thing is to cull very aggressively. Uh, when we raise um, a bloodline for meat, we may raise a thousand birds and only pick out uh, 25 or 50 of them as breeders and the other 90 to 95% get pulled. And doing that generation after generation is how that bloodline is maintained. Now that's not to say you have to do that in a small farm if you're raising them for yourself. Um, a general rule is the larger the farm, the more aggressively you have to pull. Uh, but even in a small farm, we recommend pulling at least two thirds of the birds if you wanna keep their size approximately where it starts out when you purchase the eggs from us. Uh, so that's a just a general rule, um, pull very heavily. Um, I was just on the phone with Robbie, the owner of JMF Farms, uh, earlier today, and he said he had a phone call with the owner of the largest production quail farm in the United States um, a week or two ago, and both of them agreed the largest issue for small farms trying to produce meat birds is not culling aggressively. Um, and it's interesting to note that they did not say the issue was inbreeding. Inbreeding is not normally an issue with quail when compared to culling properly. So selecting the best birds is a much, much larger issue uh, than avoiding inbreeding. You could have a great breeding program for a small farm that just inbreeds but selects very, very selectively. Uh, that's going to be better than a complex viral breeding program like the big farms use if you don't select the right birds to be in that spiral breeding program. Um, so with that said, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the specific lines. So do you want to pull up uh, that first picture that I gave you, Terry? OK. All right, those are uh, a couple of JMF Jumbo Browns. Um, I don't actually know if those are from the pair line or the meat maker line, because there's some overlap in color. Both lines will produce pharaoh and sex-linked brown. Um, and 
So it's, it's impossible from just looking at a few to differentiate them. If you have a large number, the JMF Faro line tends to have more Faro birds, and the JMF Meat Maker line tends to have more brown birds. Um, go ahead and go to that second picture. I think it'll switch from a Faro and a brown to oh no, those are the chicks. Um, what's the what's the third picture? Okay, there we go. So that's a, a brown next to a Faro. And any week that we process birds, we're going to see both of those popping up. Um, when brown is in a bloodline, it's almost impossible to breed out. And we're not necessarily breeding it for color so much as breeding it for size and productive capabilities. Um, however, if you ever purchase JMF meat maker birds or JMF aero birds and you see something else come out of it, um, it's likely someone who's not breeding them properly. So one in every uh, 10,000 birds or so will hatch with some white primaries, and that's uh, the dotted white gene that's carried in a very, very small number of those. But by and large, these should all hatch out brown or fair out. You shouldn't get any colors, definitely nothing like a Tibetan or a Tuxi or anything like that. Um, that shouldn't be hatching out. When you hatch these birds, it should look just like that picture you had earlier with a bunch of little brown birds. Um, and we hatch them by the thousands, and uh, it's, it's actually really cool to see just tray after tray coming out of identical birds just like that, um, dumping them into the brooder, they're walking all over each other, uh, learning their environment, exploring, um, and uh, learning to eat and drink. Um, so the meat maker line is the most popular, but the original line from JMF was actually the JMF Faro. That line uh, was started in the early 1970s, and JMF maintains two colonies uh, to maintain that line. So there's a, an A line and a B line of the JMF Faro. Um, the reason that he doesn't do a full spiral program is because it's really not necessary uh, when you're raising the birds for egg production. So it's a lot easier to maintain two really large colonies uh, if you're not pushing the boundaries for meat. Um, the meat maker line, on the other hand, is a little bit larger. Uh, that was developed in 2004, 2005. Um, those birds are a couple ounces larger. So those are going to be some of the largest jumbo stock available in the U.S. Um, it's a much harder breeding program to maintain. Uh, JMF does use a three-colony breeding system for that. Um, so it's a full spiral. Nothing's bred to something closer than a cousin. And that's really necessary for peaking production at that 12 to 14 ounce mark. Um, if you're raising for meat and you want to slaughter right at uh, 42 days, 46 days, somewhere around there, and have a consistent carcass, that's a great line for that. Um, most breeders don't push for more than a 14 ounce bird. Um, like I said, we with the program that we use, uh, all the partner farms um, are not supposed to be picking any birds that are outside of, uh, I believe, the 11 to 15 gram per ounce mark. Um, if it's over that size, we start to see issues with legs and tendons. Um, if it's under that size, it very quickly reverts to a standard size bird. Uh, so it's very important to select big birds um, when you're raising the meat makers. Uh, go ahead and go to the next picture. So that's two of the hens. It's a fair run of brown next to each other. Um, so that's what we'll see every week as well. Uh, I think the next picture is some whites. Go ahead and go to that one. Oh, no, this is the plumage. Um, but there's a uh, there's white bird. That one's about four weeks old. You can still see some of the yellow down around its eyes. Um, notice the birds sitting in my hand posing for a picture. Uh, these birds are not aggressive. They're very calm. Uh, just a lovely, lovely bird. Um, they're fun to raise. They're friendly. They're curious. Uh, great for kids. Um, and white birds are notoriously aggressive. There's rumors that they're aggressive. That all has to do with husbandry, and sometimes there are aggression, aggression issues from the original Texas a and line. That line is not related in any way to the JMF Jumbo Rose as a white line. So we have nothing but good things to say about the white line from JMF. It's almost identical in every quality except plumage to the meat maker line. Um, interestingly, uh, JMF started the Jumbo Rose as a white line with completely different birds from their meat maker line. However, uh, they weren't seeing the size that they wanted, so they did end up crossing them to Pharaoh and then crossing them to Meatmaker before their original release. So 
really, this is kind of the best of both worlds. It's related to both lines um, and just a very nice overall bird. So um, those are the three production lines uh, that we'll be including in our salt and pepper giveaway. Um, those are the three lines that JMF uh, created and maintains for meat and egg production. And uh, we love working with them. Uh, it's really rewarding and uh, we just love it. They're, they're great birds. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Terry, if you want to move on to Q&A uh, or, uh, or whatever's next. Okay, um, perfect. Um, yeah, let's go ahead. Let's see, what are we doing? Oh, it's 20 after. Yeah, we're doing fine on time. So we'll go ahead and jump into the question, guys. Uh, remember, well, I see Vern has already got it on there. Uh, put a cue in front of your questions. It uh, just helps me find the questions. So let's go ahead. Obviously, we have Verna in the house. Welcome, Verna. Uh, David Henry says hello from Texas. Uh, Bill's in the house. Dale's Quail's in the house. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hey, Dale. Another beautiful night. Uh, let's see. David Henry's in the house. Talking. It looks like uh, Mike is in the house. Welcome, Mike. Let me move this up just a little bit. There we go. Uh, C. Young is in the house. Chuck, welcome. Uh, Chandler, Texas. Jasmine Bass is in the house. Hi, fellow. Hiya, fellow quail fanatics. I'm excited for tonight's topic and guest. Um, not for us. Let's get down here to some questions. Moon Outdoors is in the house. Okay, Brandon says, why is the JMF line different than any other Caternix quail? Uh, so it's a different bloodline. Uh, it came from different breeding stock originally, um, and it's been maintained in a very specific way. So, uh, I suppose if you bred them improperly for five or six years and let it revert to standard size, um, then there really wouldn't be much difference. Uh, but what they're well known for is their productive qualities and then um, also the, the color purity. You really will only get um, brown and pharaoh when you're breeding them. So uh, it's great for mixing with different colors or for mixing with other bloodlines to see if you can incorporate some of those production production characteristics to the other bloodlines. Okay. Uh, while we're waiting, Homestead says, good evening, everyone. We had a perfect day here in Wyandotte County, Ohio. Welcome to the show. Uh, let's see here. Kevin Stern says, hello from Ohio. Ah, Whiskey Tango Farms in the house. Hello, everyone. Hi, Michael and Terry. Hello, Kristen and Brandon. Uh, Ed got bait, wants to know if Dale's quails got his uh, deer. <laughs> oh, bummer, he didn't get it. <laughs> uh, let's see, Grafted Branch Homestead's in the house, hello. Uh, Israel uh, is in from Puerto Rico, welcome to the show. Uh, here's a good question, David Henry wants to know, what does JMF stand for? Uh, stands for James Marie Farms. So... I believe Robbie's dad was James and his mom was Marie, and that's how they named the farm. Uh, the current owner um, is Robbie Richards. Okay. Um, Whiskey Tango Farm says, love my celadons from Southwest Game Birds. A. Jones says, hi, Terry and Michael, checking in from the northeast tip of Ohio. Thanks for doing the show. You're welcome, and thanks, Mike, for, or Michael, for showing up. Janet says, hello, from Virginia. I wonder why that, does that font look small to you? <laughs> Let me see if I can't raise that up just a little bit. It's driving me nuts. There we go. Now we can read it. Okay, Jasmine says, how long has the JMF line been around and how many breeders are allowed to continue those lines? Very good question. Yeah, so 
Uh, it depends on the line. The first one has been around since the early 70s. Uh, the other two have been around since the mid-2000s. Um, and then the number of breeders who are allowed to slap the name JMF uh, on their marketing material when they're selling eggs currently is three. Um, there's um, AJ Farms in Virginia, there's Kansas City Quail Farm in Missouri, and then there's Southwest Game Birds, us in uh, Arizona. And then of course the JMF uh, in Louisiana. Nice. Uh, let's see, while we're waiting, Homestead says, Allie's video today was great. Yes, it was. That was actually a video that she posted on Facebook but I really liked the content in that video, so I chopped it up and, and did a video and put it on the channel. Uh, let's see. Yeah, last week was in great. The house. Oh, and uh, a little more on uh, the last question of who's allowed to sell JMF eggs. Um, each of those farms uh, went through a pretty extensive vetting process. So Robbie works with uh, the three breeders extensively um, a lot of eggs go back and forth, and um, just to be considered as a partner farm, uh, took a one-year mentorship program, um, and you really had to prove that uh, you're capable of maintaining those things, you're honest, and um, several farms applied, and a uh, few made it through, but uh, <laughs> it's, um, it's been an honor working with them, and uh, a lot of folks have good and bad things to say about JMF. Um, I have nothing negative to say about him as a breeder. So he's a, he's a great breeder. He has a lot of knowledge and um, really has, it's quite an accomplishment to maintain a line as well as he has for as long as he has. So we hope to continue that legacy through Southwest Game Birds and uh, maybe eventually create a lane ourselves um, and, and do a similar thing. Cool. Now, if somebody, say, buys eggs from you, um JMF eggs, can they sell them as a JMF line, or they're not allowed to use the name? Uh, that's up to Robbie. <laughs> um, <laughs> basically, if you're not pretending to be James Murray Farms, mm -hmm. but you're saying, hey, look, we raised these eggs, they came from the JMF bloodline, um, that's completely fine. Uh, what, you, what you can't do is say, I have JMF whatever eggs, um, in such a way that it can be interpreted as you're selling from uh, his direct stock. So gotcha. that's kind of where that line is. A little bit of a gray line. Um, but there have been several farms that have impersonated JMF um, so much to the extent that they've copied his logo and really? put it on their marketing material. And then James Murray Farms will get calls from angry customers because their eggs didn't hatch or they didn't reach the weight that they're supposed to. And he has no idea what they're talking about because he never right. sold them eggs. So. That's, uh, that's been an issue for years. Um, that's really what uh, he's trying to avoid with that. Okay, David says, I volunteer to be a winner. Okay, David. Uh, well, there's Allie, Maine's Confetti Coil Farms in the house. Wahoo, so excited for this. Yes, we are. Whiskey Tango Farms hey, says, if you, were, if you were able to change anything on your journey with your quail business, what would it be? Um... Man, it's been a long learning experience. Um, if we could change one thing, uh, I think it would be uh, better accounting. So accounting is boring, uh, but it tells you which parts of your business are making money and which aren't. Right. So there were certain areas where we were not profitable that we thought we were, and it wasn't until I stepped down and did the math, uh, realized that's a, that's a big loser right there. Um, or I'm working a lot of hours on that, but it's only pulling in $5 an hour for my time. Uh, so let's just cut that area of business out and focus on um, what's good. Oh, with quail, there's so many things that I'm passionate about and I enjoy doing. Um, I enjoy the different plumage genetics. I enjoy the egg genetics. Um, and I have to keep that in check with which parts actually keep our business afloat. Um, so there's kind of that dual management, and uh, if I go back, you know, hindsight's 2020. I'd make better business decisions, um, but I'm very happy with the decisions I've made from a breeding standpoint um, and and learning uh, through that. So 
it's it's been a hard journey. I don't necessarily recommend it to people who want to start a business. It's a hard business to get into, um, but uh, it's very rewarding once you do it. Yep, I agree. Uh, McLeod Family Farm says hello from California. Uh, Chuck's got a question. How many birds do you have in the JF, JMF line inbreeding? Uh, inbreeding? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, we don't really breed, in, inbreed any of the JMF birds, but... What was that, Terry? I'm, I'm trying... I don't know if he's saying inbreeding or in breeding, you know? Um, oh, in the breeding in, program? In your breeding, how, many, how many birds do you have in that line that you're actually breeding? Just in case we... Oh, I see. Um, it, it varies dramatically. So, uh, what I think is... I guess I'll, I'll answer what I think is a more important question is the colony size. Um, so there's a there's give and take to how large of a colony size you have versus how much you select the breeder. So if you select a very small colony size, for instance, let's say you put one, one male with four females, um, you've just told the females which male is going to breed with them. Whereas if you have a larger colony size, um, we use colonies of 25. Um, there's five males in there, and there's 20 hens, uh, so they can sort of pick and choose who they're going to breed with. Um, the birds actually do a better job of choosing their mate oftentimes than we can as a breeder. Um, the, the con of having a larger colony is it's a little harder on the hens. You have to have more males to keep fertility up. So James Ring Farms and Kansas City Quail Farm do colonies of 60, and we've attempted colonies of up to 100, uh, but the breeding ratio is just ridiculous. We have to keep uh, one male for every two hens when you get up to 100 birds just to have the same quality hatching egg at the end of the day. Um, more money to feed the extra males. Uh, it's a little harder on the hens. Some are getting overbred, um, so you have higher mortality. So th there's a happy medium um, right around anywhere from 20 to 60 birds, I think, uh, to keep those lines maintained properly. Okay, Grafted Branch Homestead says, uh, what are the regulations to sell live? Are any needed meat? Uh, do you need FDA approval or anything? Um, so I think what you're talking about is non amenable meats. Um, I know in our state, there's no state regulation for selling non amenable meats. It's all done at the county level. So you have to have a county health inspector approve your facility. Um, if you choose, it's not really realistic. If you choose to go to the federal level and have a USDA approved facility, there's only one of those in the United States for quail meat. Um, that's a much longer process. But most producers, if you're selling directly to the customer, what you produce on your farm as a non amenable meat, there's very little regulation other than um, a local health inspector. Let's see, you've already answered this one. Frank says, what's JMF stand for? That's James Marie Farm. William Carl Foster's in the house. Says, there he is. Hi, William. Uh, this got to be uh, for the baby. So cute. <laughs> and oh, my heart. <laughs> okay. Uh, David Henry says, in Texas, the game warden said we could raise Texas A&M Bob White or Jumbo Coturnix without a permit, but he recommends getting the permit. What are the game bird raising requirements? Uh, that's going to vary based on the state. I don't think there's any federal requirements for raising game birds. Um, off the top of my head, there's a few states that require a permit um, to raise any number of Coturnix. Uh, I think New Mexico, even to have one bird, you need a permit. Um, other states have a threshold of 50 or 100, uh, but most states treat quail like a domestic bird, which is what it is. Um, so you don't need any permits to raise them. Um, it's really just when you want to sell them that you need permits or, uh, or certifications. If you want to sell across state lines, there's all kinds of rules. Um, and if you want to sell for consumption, then there are rules. So um, again, if you're a small producer, it's usually a little more lax, but there's usually a threshold where if you want to do it as a business, there's a, a whole different set of rules, um, and it's usually a health inspector or 
an egg certification um, where they want to make sure you're selling a safe product. They want to make sure you're selling a disease-free product if it's live, uh, so on and so forth. Yep. Okay. Yeah, in Florida we got, there's no uh, regulations on less than 50 birds. Uh, once you keep more than 50, you got to pay a $25 just for a permit. Real simple to get. Uh, Richard Brown says, can you have too much humidity in the incubation period? Yes, absolutely. So too much humidity will increase the water content in the egg. Uh, the chick will actually grow too large and it will have weak bone structure, weak muscle tone. So what you'll get if there's too much humidity during, during incubation is a large weak chick. They're sometimes called mushy chicks. Mm -hmm. um, and then you'll have a lower hatch rate if they're too weak to hatch. Uh, when they pit, the internal pip is when they break into the air sac in the egg, and the external pip is when they break through the shell. Between the internal pip and the external pip is a limited amount of time where the bird has to muster the strength to peck a hole in the whole outside rim of the shell. It's called unzipping the shell. Pop the lid off the unzipped shell and then hatch out. Um, if that air sac is too small from having high humidity throughout the incubation period, then the chick does not have as long to do an external pit. Um, the other thing about high humidity is it can impede the last stage of development where the chick fully absorbs the yolk sac into its abdomen. And so you'll get what's called an uncured navel. And uh, that's visible on the chick if you open the unhatched egg or the pipped egg where the chick didn't survive. Uh, you'll see an un uncured navel. Sometimes uh, the un uncured, unhealed navel can heal if it's very minor. Usually, it's um, if it's about the size of a pea or smaller, uh, the bird can survive. If it's larger than that, the bird normally doesn't survive. Okay. Uh, Brandon says, "How long has Southwest Game Birds been around, and why did you get into quail?" <laughs> uh, a long story, but in short, uh, I. Did not like my job, didn't like my employer, and uh, I thought I'll make you go with the spoil thing. Um, we started the farm in 2017, and we started as a small hobby farm. Um, I started helping another farmer uh, raise birds for meat production, and he couldn't meet his demand. Uh, so he kind of took us under his wing, showed us the ropes. Um, then we did our JMF mentorship program in 2018. And then in 2019, we um, invested everything we had. We took a big risk. We moved, bought some farmland, built a big facility, and started what has become Southwest Gamers today. Yeah, and guys, if you look back through some of the uh, uh, live streams that we did, the last time Michael was on here, there's actually photos of his, of his farm, his building, and everything. So if you want to check that out, and it's pretty nice. Okay, while we're waiting, Homestead so. says, uh, <laughs> how do you breed out unwanted traits? Can you be sure the birds, how can you be sure the birds you're using are pure? Uh, so it depends on the trait and it can be a very long process. Um, I'll go through an example that uh, we have not done personally, but James Marie Farms does uh, every few years. If they want to freshen a bloodline, and put unrelated stock into known stock. Um, let's say they just did an import from a meat line in Brazil, which they did a few years ago. Uh, they will <coughs> cross the birds, then they will take those birds and they will recross them every which way you can imagine. Through the males of this generation to the females of that, the females of that to the males of that, uh, inbreed four generations in a row in small quantities to pull out any negative traits just to identify them. Uh, once you've identified the positive traits and isolated those, and if there are any negative traits, uh, remove those, um, then that can become part of the bloodline uh, in the breeding program. The problem is, if it's too much of a, if there's too many negative traits, or what you were shooting for didn't pan out, um, you can't reverse it. So it's very important when you're crossing unrelated blood that has unknown characteristics to keep your original breeding stock. Uh, and James Marie Farms goes back four generations for that. So whenever they freshen a bloodline and introduce something unknown, they will maintain 
the old bloodline for four generations so that if they mess it up with whatever they're crossing in, it's not too late to go back. Uh, and so that's, that's very important because if you cross something unknown, uh, you may not know what you've messed up until it's too late to fix. So uh, in, in a lot of cases, it really can't be fixed. Okay. Uh, David Henry says, uh, this is an extended question, um, also which breed would you recommend? Or which variety would you recommend? Sure. Uh, so a very common question. Um, quail doesn't actually have a breed standard. So like you said, we use the word variety. Um, uh, we also call them bloodlines or strains. Um, it depends on what your goals are. So if you want to raise birds for meat production for yourself, small homestead, your family, um, the most popular line is the JMF meat maker. If you just want eggs, um, you can still raise meat maker, um, but you have a little more flexibility. Normally, the JMF Faro is the best egg line if you don't care about meat production. Um, if you're selling to a restaurant and you want a really pretty carcass, you don't want pin feathers showing, you don't want any staining around the vent, um, that's what the Jumbo Recessive White line is for. So uh, the white birds are making big waves in the Caternix industry in the United States. Uh, some of the biggest farms in the country are switching from brown to white, to white as we speak. And uh, chefs are noticing it's more presentable uh, in restaurants and whatnot. Um, but it really just depends on your goals. If you like colors, uh, you can raise whatever color you want. They're all gonna produce eggs. Um, what's interesting is even a, a small or standard sized bird um, can often produce a very nice egg if it's raised properly. So if you have proper husbandry and proper nutrition, um, a small bird can outproduce a large bird um, if you're looking at feed to egg ratios in production. So if you really just want eggs, um, you don't even have to go with the JMF line. Uh, a, a lot of lines can produce eggs really well. Um, if you want meat um, or if you want a dual purpose bird, uh, we say just start with the Jumbo Brown and the JMF. Jumbo Browns are a great way to start. Are, are the whites getting up to the same weight as the meat makers? Uh, we've never noticed a difference. Really? So the only difference we've noticed is in appearance. Okay. Billy says, why are Manchurian different color from different breeders and how do you get the Manchurian? Uh, so they shouldn't be uh, very different. There's some minor variations from what we call modifier genes. So it may modify how wide the pattern in striation is, or you may have one with a, a lighter gold instead of a darker gold. Um, there are some birds that have some white striping on the head in Manchurian versus solid. If it has sex in brown, you'll get a redder mass uh, instead of a black mass. But by and large, if, if it's a Manchurian bird, it has the fawn gene. And uh, it always acts almost the exact same. So one copy of fawn will give you an Italian phenotype, and then two copies will give you the gold Manchurian. Brandon wants to know, what do you feed your quails? Uh, we feed them game bird feed. We actually have it custom milled from Purina Mills, uh, and it's... Uh, delivered by the semi so uh if you I, the best way to do it if you have a specific bloodline and you're looking for a specific result is to go custom like that um the problem is minimum orders are usually six to ten thousand pounds so if you can't do that uh like we said purina startina is the gold standard for uh starter feed and there are a lot of commercial farms that use that uh, um uh they make a laina feed um, that's a, a great feed for adult quail. Um, and I think you can get those at tractor supply. They don't always stock them, but you can always have them custom order for you. Right. So it's fairly available. Alrighty. Are you guys seeing a uh, price increase in feed out there? Uh, it hasn't been dramatic, but our feed's always been expensive. Yeah. Um, even wholesale, uh, it's it's up to 50% more expensive on the West Coast than it is in other parts of the country. Really? Yeah, we're looking at about, for 50 pound bags, like 25.50 for a, a bag of Gamebird starter. 
which I used to get it for 18 bucks uh -huh. all day long. So. Okay, Whiskey Tango it's Farm says, what's that? Oh, I said it's unfortunate it costs that yeah. much. It's hard enough to raise quail. Yeah. Uh, Whiskey Tango Farm says, what advice would you give your past self when you were getting started? Any regrets? And what are your biggest successes? Oh, boy. Um, I don't want to be too negative, uh, but uh, we, we trust people too easily. So I think I would advise myself to be a little more cautious. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, to wait for things are proven before investing too much in them. So... Uh, it's, it's easy to think, oh, if I raise uh, a thousand birds and you do the math on paper, how many eggs they'll produce, I can make this much money and then I can quit my job. Uh, it's, right. it's not always realistic um, and it's been a much longer haul than I expected. So I think uh, just caution and patience. Um, when you're starting a farm, agriculture is not an easy business to get into. Um, and then you have to be smart. Uh, Every, every little bit of waste um, counts against your bottom line, so find ways to use that um, or to not create waste. Um, we have a lot of wasted feed, uh, and it just um, ends up in the compost pile and then wild birds come in. So we have a, a system for that now um, where we have some free-range birds that manage our compost pile and turn that into eggs that we use and give away, um, and as well as some meat. So uh, it's a... It's certainly interesting. I don't have a background in agriculture. I have a background in science. Uh, so this is all new to me. It's, it's been a learning experience, and uh, it's certainly been interesting. Nice. Okay, John says, coming up on winter, what are some good tips to winterize the do's and the don'ts, and should you use higher protein food to keep them warmer? Um, <coughs> quail are notoriously cold hardy. Um, I, I know a lot of folks don't even change food and they see the birds keep laying even below freezing. So, uh, as long as they are protected from, um, wind and they're protected from moisture, uh, you really don't have to do much in the winter, uh, with quail. If on the other hand, you're trying to brood chicks and raise young birds in the winter, um, uh, you want to basically bring them indoors, so protect them as much as possible from the elements. And uh, that's a that's a whole other nightmare trying to raise chicks and fight the cold. Um, <laughs> it can be fairly expensive too. But uh, you know, with adult birds, uh, they're so easy. That's that's one of the great things about quail is they can take 120 degree heat or they can take negative 20 degree cold. So they're great. Yep. David Henry says, "Hungry quail get into MMA cage matches." I did not know this. <laughs> Richard Brown says, yep. "Are males the young and females?" Yeah, really. <laughs> Are the young jumbos less feral than the other kind of catonics? Less feral? Um, no, the, the color stays the same. Their plumage does develop as they age, uh, especially after they molt. So the feral, in particular. Um, when they go through an adult molt, will get very, very striking. So it's always interesting looking at a bird that's um, 12 to 16 months old, um, how dark the pharaoh gets. Um, we don't keep them that long for production, but uh, we have kept them just to look and see how that develops. Okay. Brandon says, uh, what should you do when you find that your quail haven't eaten for a while? Uh, what should you give them to boost them back up? Uh, so if they're starving and malnourished, um, if they are babies uh, and you want to give them an extra boost, crushed mealworms work great, any type of crushed bug. Um, you can also dehydrate egg yolk and powder that, uh, form, make that into a powder and feed them that. Uh, it's a very rich food source for baby quail. Um, as far as uh, just giving them the feed that they should be on normally, uh, you may see them gorge themselves. Uh, make sure they don't get dehydrated. So if they eat a lot of food, they need a lot of water. Uh, last thing you want to happen is for them to gorge and then uh, run out of water and dehydrate. Um, you also want to keep an eye on uh, crop issues uh, or digestion issues. If they eat a lot of food, 
and drink water and the water expands the food. Uh, sometimes uh, they can choke, they can spit that back up uh, or, or they can have other issues like that. Um, for adult quail, uh, if they run out of food and you realize that they're hungry, you see some cannibalism where they're attacking each other or whatnot. Um, if you give them food, the cannibalism should stop. You may have to remove the birds that are injured or vice versa um, until they heal. Uh, and there's a lot of the same issues. Um, birds have been known to gorge if they're starving and then because of uh, crumbled feeds being dehydrated, then when they drink, um, it can expand and uh, rupture certain things. So you can keep an eye out for that. If you notice a blockage, it can normally be massaged out. Um, those things are very rare. Normally, if you keep them fed and hydrated, uh, and if you notice they're out of food and just immediately give them food and water, they'll be fine. Um, uh, I'm trying to think what else. Um, oh, just note that if, if a quail doesn't have food for a substantial amount of time, um, it has a fast metabolism. It will very quickly uh, go into ketosis. It will start um, digesting its own muscle and fat tissue. And it can often induce a molt. Um, they will, can start pulling out their own feathers as well. And don't expect them to start laying eggs right away. So a quail that goes without food for about 30 hours uh, can stop laying eggs for 14 to 21 days. So it's very common for someone to say, why aren't my birds laying? They have food and water, um, but maybe they didn't have food and water a couple of days ago, and so they're not gonna be laying for a while. Um, the egg process, it takes about 10 days for an egg to develop. It also takes time uh, for a bird to get back to where it wants to produce eggs for you. Right. So they have to be well-fed and have constant access to water um, all the time without exception to lay eggs. Do you offer food uh, around the pot? Yes, we do. And then I really recommend automatic waterers. Right. It's it's so easy to let the water run out. Um, if you don't notice that, it's a big issue. So automatic waters are not that difficult to set up. And then you will reap the benefits on a daily basis by not having to manually water your birds. Yep. Okay, Animal33 says, what is considered optimum temperature for adults and chicks? Um, so chicks, it varies. Uh, when they're born, they need 95 degrees. Uh, when they're about a week old, that goes down to 90. Um, when they're two weeks old, if they are raised properly, um, they'll start to feather out a little bit and they'll have some more fat reserves and body mass so they can take uh, 80 to 85 degrees. Um, a three week old bird, depending on your climate, uh, again, the caveat is always if it's raised properly, if it has proper plumage development, fat development, whatnot. Um, three week old bird can often be taken off heat and a four week old bird can always be taken off heat. Um, so four weeks old, they should be fully feathered. If you see a bald patch on their belly, that means they're not fully feathered. So that means they are going to need to get some amount of heat. Um, it, like I said, if you're in a tropical climate or a warm climate, um, they may not need heat at that age. But if you're in a cold climate, they need to be fully feathered. Um, adult birds, optimal temperature is normally uh, 65 to 70 degrees. Um, it's not always possible. And it's not always um, efficient. Uh, you may pay more to get your barn at 65 degrees than uh, you'll reap from eggs. I know in Arizona, when it's 115 degrees outside, um, the amount of air conditioning units that you would have to have to keep a large barn at 65 degrees is unrealistic. So the birds will be productive under 90 degrees, um, and then they'll be productive over yeah, I think the, the low end temperature, the issue is if you're producing hatching eggs, the eggs shouldn't go under 40, 45 degrees. Um, they really shouldn't go under 50, but uh, if they go under 45 or 40, they'll all die. Um, and if they freeze, then they won't be good for eating eggs either. Okay. Yeah, I don't have a problem with cold. <laughs> I have a problem with heat down here. Uh, Tamara says, do you ever have problems with lice, and if so, what do you do about it? Um, I lost your audio, Michael. You accidentally muted yourself? Hit the button on the...
Do you see the do you see the mute button? Nope, still muted. There should be a little little speaker with a line through it. Should be able to hit that speaker. <clears throat> okay, Michael, I'm just going to disconnect you. Just call right back in, okay? All right, while he's doing that, um, let's see, we do have... Yeah, we still have quite a few questions to go, so um, I don't know how long Michael's going to be able to hang around tonight. It is five minutes to eight now, so uh, hopefully we can get through all your questions, guys. And uh, come on, Michael, call back in. Um, yeah, we'll find out here in a minute as soon as he gets back on. See, we've got a lot of people in the chat rooms asking questions. This is great. Yeah, I know, guys. We lost his feed. He's going to be calling right back in. Um, we just lost his audio, so uh, it's easiest for him to just call back into the show. So uh, give him a minute. He should be right back in here. Uh, guys, if you would, uh, don't forget to put the uh, type the letter Q in front of your questions. Um, what I'm probably going to do now, because we're, we're getting on in time, I'm probably just going to read off the, the actual questions instead of going through and reading every single one. Um, I don't, like I say, I don't know how much time Michael's got uh, tonight. So... Uh-oh, there he is. He's calling back in. Okay. All right, you there, Michael? Hey, can you hear me now? We can hear you. All right, very sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, no big deal. It's happened before. <laughs> what were we uh, on, Tamara's question? What's that? Were we on Tamara's question? No, what happened, when you touch the camera, you must have accidentally hit the uh, mute button. And sometimes it, it's hard to find that mute button, so... No big deal. Okay. All right. Whiskey Tango Farm says, what breeding program do you use? Spiral breeding or how do you rotate out your birds? Um, yeah. So typically with the production line, it's a spiral breeding program with three spot, uh, three colonies. Um, James Marie Farms uses uh, two colonies for the pharaoh line. Uh, so those are just switched uh, back and forth, males from one with females of the other. Um, rather than a full spiral. Okay. Um, while we're waiting, Homestead says, what is spiral breeding? Uh, so I think there's some detailed explanations online, but basically you separate the birds into three groups uh, or more, uh, but typically you do three groups and then you will raise them separately and then you'll take the males from one and move them over with the females from the next group. So nothing's actually inbreeding. Uh, they're all breeding with their cousins um, or non-related birds, depending on how large uh, each colony is. Okay. Um, how are you uh, set for time tonight, Michael? We're already at 8 o'clock. Uh, I'm flexible. So. Okay. Yep. Okay, Animal33 says, at how many weeks do we stop feeding them starter crumbles? Uh, it depends on their condition. So if... Uh, it, and it depends on the, the starter feed. So it's really going to be different in every situation. Um, we will feed them starter feed until seven weeks and then transition them to layer feed. Um, but we also have them on a slightly leaner starter feed. We grow our birds out a little slower. Um, it's a very digestible feed, so we're really happy with it, um, mm -hmm. but a little lower protein. If you have them on a nice high protein feed, they may be ready to switch to layer a little sooner. Um, it also depends on how soon you introduce light. So if they have full light, uh, they'll, they'll want to start laying by six to eight weeks. So possible they'll need the extra calcium, although usually they don't. Um, 
one thing you want to avoid is red light. So after they're done with the brooding stage, uh, it's fine if you use red lights while they're brooding. Um, but you want to take the red light away after four weeks because otherwise they'll start laying eggs too soon. So red light actually induces um, sexual maturity and you can get eggs as early as five weeks with birds left on red light. And that's not good for the birds' long health at all, uh, long-term health at all. Okay. Uh, David Henry says, when raising chickens, I would always put seven dust in their dust bath. Uh, you recommend having a dust bath in a pen and is it okay to use seven dust on quail? Uh, I'm not familiar with that product. Uh, dust baths are great for birds. Uh, they lower stress. Um, they will stop regression issues oftentimes. Um, if your birds eat anything other than a standard crumble, then uh, it can introduce grit uh, if it's a sand dust bath. Um, and if they're on the ground, uh, they can be prone to mites and other parasites, uh, like lice uh, mentioned in a comment earlier. Um, dust baths are great for protecting birds against parasites. Okay. Kevin says, what is the biggest thing in your operation you think you need to or want to improve? Hmm. Um, redundancy. So we live way out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, power outages are very common. Uh, water outages are common. Uh, so we're working on redundancy. Uh, we have a backup generator um, and that can power our well if something goes wrong. But uh, we've recently been reevaluating some of that so that if uh, the worst happens, we're ready and we don't lose the blood lines that we've worked so hard to acquire. Brandon says, when butchering, do you take the food away at any point beforehand? Uh, we normally fast for 12 to 24 hours. So that, that clears out most of their gut. Um, makes a slightly less gross product <laughs> after it's butchered. Right. Logan says, why did you choose the JMF line? Um, we had tried a couple other lines. Uh, we did a lot of research and reached out to JMF. Um, we just wanted to try out the best line in the U.S., and that's what we thought it was. So um, we did that, and uh, I, I think it is the best production line uh, in the U.S. right now. Um, there's a German line that uh, came, from, uh, came from Germany, but it was released by Kansas City Quail Farm. And that's a good contender. Uh, they produce really nice eggs. Um, there's a uh, there's another line in the Northeast. Um, I think a couple of the big commercial farms will sell their eggs. Uh, but really, as far as accessible bloodlines, uh, JMS is kind of the gold standard in the U.S. And almost almost everything else is related to it in some way, or it's just JMF rebranded by another farm. Brandon says, what did you do to produce your cello downline and how long did you work on it? Um, so we just got our Celadon line from Kansas City Quail Farm. Uh, Celadon originally was imported with the Schofield Silver Collection and it's since then morphed into a bunch of different things. So we have probably a dozen different strains of Celadon at this point. We have crossed them to all kinds of bloodlines to see if we can improve it. Some of the issues with Celadon are size, um, some issues with fertility rate, and then just overall uh, viability once they're shipped. A lot of times Celadons will hatch at a slightly lower rate. They're just not as tough as our production lines. So we're working to improve that and create a Celadon line uh, that produces hatching eggs that can ship well. Um, it's a nice vibrant blue. Um, what's interesting is some of our Celadon eggs are actually a cream color. There's no blue whatsoever. And then some of them are almost white. Um, but we, we really like the bright blue. I think that's what most people want when they order a Celadon egg, because that's what it's known for. And then we're trying to breed out the, uh, the little black spots and speckles or any type of shell deformity uh, or imperfection. So we have a whole bunch of different Celadons, uh, a whole bunch of different Celadon bloodlines. Um, but we'll usually pull from the, the tried and proven ones 
Most of those ends up being uh, Tibetan tuxedo or range tuxedo birds. Um, it's a, a standard sized bird, lays a standard sized egg. Um, they're a lot of fun, um, but I think Celadon, there's a lot of room for improvement. So I'm looking forward to seeing what that turns into in the next couple of years. Okay, cool. Uh, Tamara says, do you wash your eggs before you sell them to your customers? Never. Uh, washing eggs is a big no-no uh, when you're selling hatching eggs. Um, when a bird lays an egg, there's a natural protective layer called the bloom, um, and that protects bacteria from entering the egg. Uh, so eggs will not stay good as long if they're washed. Um, really, unless you're in a really, really large commercial facility, um, far larger than what we operate, um, there's no benefit to washing eggs even immediately before incubation. So you see in the major chicken hatcheries, they will wash the eggs, um, but the incubator is kept completely sanitary. So um, there's all kinds of filters, it's washed between each use. Um, not really something you can do in a home setting. If you have a standard tabletop incubator, there's a little vent on it. So if you sanitize it, then there's bacteria in your incubator within seconds. So you definitely don't want to wash eggs before you hatch them. Okay, Whiskey Tango Farm says, uh, what do you use for record keeping as far as how old your birds are, which cage they're in, uh, who the parents are, etc." We use a uh, good old fashioned Sharpie pen. Uh, we use stickers and we use Microsoft Excel. So we've got kind of a master list of what bloodlines we're keeping, where they are, how old they are, when they were hatched. Um, some basic notes we'll add in there. Um, and then on each cage, uh, we'll mark uh, what the eggs are. We have a skew for each bloodline uh, and each strain. So we'll mark exactly what's in each cage. If a bird ever gets out, it goes right into the freezer. Uh, we don't risk mixing bloodlines ever. Um, and then uh, we'll usually write um, other dates that are pertinent. So for example, uh, in the meat production lines, there's a multi-stage call uh, system that we use. So we'll do an initial call at six weeks. Um, then we'll do a second call at eight weeks. And so we'll write the date of that second call so that we don't do it early. So if we do that between eight and nine weeks, that's fine. But we wait until at least the date written on that cage to go through it and, and do the final call before we select breeders. Um, so we, uh, we, we track all that stuff. Um, Bookkeeping is really important when you raise quail, especially when you have a lot of different bloodlines, uh, and it takes a lot of time. Yeah. Okay, David Henry says, I'm having a difficult time finding a reliable supplier for eggs. Can you put the JMF website link in here? Uh, sure. Um, uh, I think it's just jmf.com. Um, you can order directly from them uh, if you want your eggs faster. Uh, or you want a small quantity, uh, then you can order them from a partner farm. And uh, we can provide you with all those links. Okay. Uh, Logan says, why did you choose the JMF line and have you had any problems with them? If so, what are some of the problems you've encountered? Um, so there's always problems in small percentages uh, with the bloodlines we work with. Um, normally, uh, when you're starting up, there's a big learning curve. So when we first started, uh, you know, the birds were all dying in the brooder. So we were like any other beginner with quail. Um, once we had the general process for raising them down um, and we had started in the mentorship program, um, Robbie was there holding our hands uh, whenever we had an issue. Um, there were a few times we were losing adult birds and didn't know why and it was something unique to our cage system that was not allowing the birds to access the last 25% uh, of their food. So it really? uh, took us a while to figure out why they were um, why they were hungry. So <laughs> they weren't starving because they were fed regularly enough, but they weren't quite getting enough food. So they were starting to exhibit some of those um, tendencies that you see when uh, the birds are underfed or malnourished. And, uh, so we figured that out. Um, as for problems with the line genetically, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good line. Um, there's always going to be some mortality uh, when you raise quail. 
um, but we normally don't see more than uh, 10 to 15 percent mortality from hatch to eight weeks. And then um, there's always a percentage of uh, birds that will prolapse whenever you're raising birds that lay large eggs. So um, we have not personally tracked the prolapse percentage because we haven't uh, noticed large numbers. Um, it's usually just a, a bird occasionally here or there. So as long as it's under a couple percent um, throughout a uh, several month period, um, that's, that's fairly normal. There are bloodlines that have issues where 25% of the hens will prolapse, and I uh, definitely would want to address that. Um, but we haven't seen that with the JMF lines, and um, we haven't seen issues with um, resilience to uh, disease or um, leg and knee issues, which you get from raising really heavy birds. Um, they tend to be pretty robust. Okay, while we're waiting, Homestead said, will celadon eggs produce chicks that will lay celadon eggs? That is uh, exactly how you want to get celadon eggs. Um, now, if your celadon was bred to a non-celadon, uh, it's possible that you could have a blue egg hatched and produce a bird that won't lay a blue egg. Um, if it's a celadon line that is uh, homozygous for the celadon gene, um, you're, al you're always going to get Okay, you froze there for a second, but I think we're good now. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, we're good. We just okay. had a little glitch. Uh, Brandon says, why do a lot of breeders not like the sex link brown line or sex link browns in their birds? Um, it's personal preference. Uh, so a lot of color enthusiasts uh, breeding different varieties of plumage patterns. Mm -hmm. um, they don't want sex link brown because they want to just know what that one gene does to the plumage. Um, a lot of people like sex link brown in it more than fair, than just Pharaoh. So uh, it really is personal preference. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the issue is the variability and the predictability of plumage outcomes is, is why a lot of breeders don't like it. Okay. Uh, David says, we want to sell eggs and meat as we grow out. Um, do you have any advice for those for doing this as a business other than word of mouth? Um, we have all kinds of advice for that. Um, it, it depends on what market you're going into. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in starting a business to sell eggs or meat, um, <coughs> find a mentor, uh, find someone who's been in it, who knows the, uh, the market and knows where there's a need. Um, you don't want to get into a hyper competitive market because there are so many people um, with a, the new culture of working for yourself or working from home ever since uh, COVID-19 hit, um, who lost their jobs and thought they could start a quail farm. And so there's certain niche markets that are just hyper competitive. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people selling eggs at less than what it costs to produce the eggs. Right. So. Um, when we were when we reviewed our cost accounting uh, to determine our prices and what profit margins we needed, and then looked at the average cost of uh, those products, um, hatching eggs is an example. It's just hyper competitive. If you want to get into selling hatching eggs online uh, or on eBay or any of the common platforms, um, a lot of times the average price is right around what it costs to produce them. So make sure you're not getting yourself into that if you want to start a business and actually support a family or, or your lifestyle, then um, make sure you're getting into a business that can be successful and find people who know what they're doing and give you advice. Um, and then if there's something specific, feel free to reach out to us. We'll, we'll be happy to have a conversation with you. Yep. I've noticed I've actually done better locally than I have trying to sell, you know, hatching eggs online or uh, most of my business comes from people wanting eating eggs, so and I get a lot more for them. So. Makes sense. Uh, Brandon wants to know, why are some of the brown on the picture of the chicks darker than others? Um, so there's a couple things. Uh, first, there's sex link brown and pharaoh in a lot of those pictures of chicks. And secondly, there's some natural <coughs> variation in chicks when they hatch. So. If you have um, 
a large gene pool, which the JMF bloodlines are, um, there's always going to be some natural variation. So that's that's what accounts for most of that. It's interesting to have birds that are useful for laboratory research. Um, they, they call them inbred lines, and you have to inbreed for 20 generations. And then the bird becomes uh, homozygous for about 99% of its genetics. Uh, and then that's considered a, a useful inbred line for, for research. And those, I assume, would look identical when they hatch. Um, but even then, who, who knows? There may be some natural variation just from that 1% of the genes that are still different. Cool. I did not know that. Okay, Katrina says, we keep hearing about this mutation and that mutation and this gene and that gene. People talking about it. People talk about it like all of the mutations are known. How often does a new mutation show up? Um, a spontaneous mutation uh, that's visible in the plumage is fairly rare. Uh, normally they're discovered in large production farms. Um, but I, I don't really know the answer as, as to how often a plumage mutation would show up. Um, there's a natural um, amount of coding mistakes each time um, a bird reproduces a cell. <coughs> so there's always a percentage of mistakes. Which mistakes turn into a mutation that leaves the bird still viable, uh, that its immune system doesn't recognize and uh, cut out. Um, normally, if there's a mutation that's significant, uh, there's a process called apoptosis that will kill that cell. Um, but for, for new mutations, uh, the, the list of known mutations is fairly short uh, for plumage. It's only about, um, I believe, 60 or 70 mutations. Uh, that said, the ones that are known are just the obvious ones, so there's probably 10 times that many uh, in existence now, and, and who knows how often a new one shows up. But there's a couple that are not identified right now that we're studying that we've just noticed in our farm, and I don't think that those showed up on our farm. I think uh, they exist in some of the collections or bloodlines that we received, and we just noticed them first. So there's a couple others that we did not notice first, but uh, we, we pulled out. So uh, an example of that is uh, Calico. We, we pulled Calico out from our uh, German pastel collection birds and did it about the same time that I believe William Foster uh, got a hold of it. So ours have Fee and his are on uh, Brown or Faro. So we'll be uh, talking about those more this spring, probably releasing them uh, sometime February or March. Uh, Verna wants to know, how much do the uh, JMF jumbos weigh? Um, it depends on the bird. The females will weigh about 20% more than the males. Um, and then the JMF Pharaoh line is going to be 10 to 12 ounces normally. Um, and that's uh, at least 75% of the bird should be in that weight. Um, and then the meat maker and the, the white lines are going to be a little bit larger. I think they're about one or two ounces larger on average, so they're going to be right in that uh, 12 to 14 ounce mark um, range for the weight. Okay. Uh, Chad wants to know what kind of brooder setup do you use? Um, so we have a custom brooder. We did a custom build. Um, it has uh, heating elements at the top with the reflectors that <coughs> shine down, um, and then. It's about a foot tall, so we use electric heat and we trap it in the brooder itself. Um, and then we let the birds venture out once they're old enough. Um, but they're raised on either uh, pine shavings or on a floor of feed directly. And um, if you are familiar with the GQF brooders, uh, it's a very similar design to those. Let's see, Brandon says, how can you tell if you have sex link brown? What does it look like in male or females? Also, what age can you identify it? Um, so I'm not sure exactly what age you can identify it. I, I suspect by three weeks uh, you can start to identify it. Um, and we have pictures on our website, side-by-side uh, -side pictures of sex link brown and pharaoh. Uh, there's a little link at the top right of the page on southwestgamebirds.com for resources, and it would be the plumage genetics. 
So you can scroll down there for all of the common mutations uh, that exist in the United States. And uh, sex-linked brown is a uh, guy been pictured there, um, as well as Rue. Rue. Rue looks very similar. So there's a side by side with all three. Um, if you go through those images. Okay. Uh, Chuck says, "What's the average weight for a processed bird?" Um, it depends on how old you raise them. So, uh, generally, our meat markets will want a six to eight week old bird, um, and processed. That's going to weigh, gosh. Uh, six or seven ounces. Um, but I think if you raise a 12 ounce bird, um, and someone else may know these numbers better, but I think you can get uh, a 10 ounce bird process. Um, the general rule of thumb is it's about half of the live weight uh, is the process weight. So um, that would be a little more than half. But uh, I think um, raised to that age, uh, they put on enough meat and fat, um, you can get an eight to 10 ounce bird. Okay. While we're waiting, Homestead says, what's does JMF mean? That's James Marie Farms. We've answered that yep. once. Uh, Whiskey Tango Farms says, how many breeders do you have? Quail breeders. Um, it, it varies dramatically. So for the JMF bloodlines, uh, from each group, we try to maintain at least a few hundred. Um, but yeah, we have several thousand birds for the whole breeding program. Tilapia Store says, what is the white breed? Uh, so that's called uh, James Marie Farms Jumbo Recessive White. Um, the name may be a little misleading. Uh, there's some debate currently about recessive white versus dotted white, um, and if it's even recessive, uh, but that's what he's named the bloodline is James JMF Jumbo Recessive White. Um, so that's what that is. As far as the actual inheritance, occasionally what we've noticed is um, a white primary or two if they're carrying the white gene, whereas um, if they have two copies, then you have a full-on white bird that maybe has a little spot of dark plumage on the back of its head and sometimes uh, somewhere on the body. Okay, Brandon says, how many jumbo lines do you have? Um, we have quite a few. So we have the three James Marie Farms Jumbo Lines, and then we have uh, the German Brown Jumbo Line, and <coughs> then we have a handful of experimental Jumbo Lines uh, that are not available to the public, uh, as well as the German Sparkly Collection, um, which I will not call a Jumbo Line yet until it's proven, uh, but we're getting some very nice sizes from those birds as well. Uh, Brandon also wants to know, do you sell clean, quote, clean pharaohs? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do not. Yeti says, uh, are the white birds meat birds also? Meat birds too. Yes. Uh, white birds have identical um, size characteristics to the meat maker. Whiskey Tango Farm says, uh, "Thank you, Michael. Always thank you for always letting me pick your brain. I appreciate it." <laughs> Definitely. Brandon wants to know what's your fastest growing line and what is the average weight at eight or ten weeks. Um, so, off the top of my head, the fastest growing line uh, that's a proven <coughs> line would be the James Marie Farms Meat Maker and the Jumbo Recessive White. Um, those grow at about the same rate and at eight to ten weeks, um, they should have hit uh, ten ounces. Normally, by about twelve weeks to sixteen weeks, they're full grown at their twelve to fourteen ounce mark. Um, but uh, yeah, by ten weeks, uh, approximately seventy-five percent of those should have hit the ten ounce mark. Um, that's the definition of a true jumbo, um, and often those will hit those weights uh, comfortably and uh, pretty consistently if they're raised right. Okay. Uh, Katrina says, this question showed up in the Newbie Quail Lovers group today, not her original question. Can molting affect fertility? What other things may affect fertility? Oh boy, that's a 
That's a good one. Uh, there's all kinds of things that can affect fertility. Molting is one of them. Um, it also affects egg production. So if they're not producing eggs, uh, they're not going to have any uh, fertility. Um, other things that affect fertility, uh, the most common things are stress uh, and nutrition. So um, stress, nutrition, and then age goes hand in hand with molting. So depending on your environment, um, if you live in a warmer climate, they'll usually molt sooner. If you live in a colder climate, they may molt a little later. Um, and I, I don't actually know um, when their fertility will start to drop based on climate. Uh, but I know typically fertility uh, for us will drop after that molt. Okay. Animal 333 says, at what age do you select your breeders and at what weight? Uh, so there's a multi-stage process. Um, we typically pull out all of our breeding prospects at six weeks, and then we will do a, a, a second cull at eight weeks, and then we will actually do a third cull uh, when they are much older. So for the end of their laying cycle, uh, James Marie Farms wants us to do it at nine months, uh, or sorry, at eight months, so we do it as close to that as we can. Um, so right around the eight month mark is when we will call for our own breeding stock and that will actually uh, select for all kinds of things. That's how we keep our prolapse rates low. Uh, it's how we keep uh, long-term growth rates and egg production rates high. Um, so obviously we're selling hatching eggs all year, but generation to generation uh, to maintain the bloodlines, we have to pull much more specifically uh, at that older age. Okay. Uh, Yeti wants to know how many birds should someone breed to keep a family, to keep feeding a family of three? Um, depends on how much quail you want to eat. So, um, to account for accidents uh, or losses, uh, we usually recommend keeping at least two males. And <clears throat> to keep males from overbreeding, that means you would need at least eight hens. So, uh, a little colony of two. Um, two males and eight females will produce quite a lot of meat uh, if you care for them properly and keep the chicks alive. So uh, I would say start with at least that. Um, if you want to also eat eggs, then uh, keep a larger colony. Um, but there's nothing stopping you in a very small amount of space uh, for keeping 20 or 25 birds very easily. Um, and if, if they have <coughs> access to food and water, um, really a, a small cage, um, five or six square feet, uh, can, can comfortably house those. And that's walking space, so uh, make sure to account for that when you're putting a dust bath or you're putting, um, you know, hides or branches or other things for stimulation. They need at least a quarter of a foot of walking space um, to stay healthy. Okay. Uh, Russell says, can you have a jumbo wild hen that doesn't have the black speckles on her chest? more of a brown splash color? Um, so, a few things. Uh, so the plumage variety that um, is wild type is called pharo, and by definition, the females would have those spots and then the males wouldn't. Um, uh, wild is, is kind of derived from wild type, uh, so it's a mixture of the phrase wild type and the plumage variety, Faro. Um, and then Jumbo is your size class, so that will not affect plumage. Um, but the answer is no, there shouldn't be too much variation. Uh, the female should always have the speckles. They should always have the same general pattern. Okay. Yeti wants to know if you ship live birds? Uh, when the weather permits. So okay. we are about to start shipping them for the fall, and then we'll stop uh, in the winter. Um, <coughs> So I guess I'll caveat it when the weather permits or the shipping season permits, because at Christmas time, uh, they'd be in the mail too long to survive. So we stop shipping for the Christmas season. And then in, uh, in January, we pick back up and ship through the spring until it gets too hot. Okay, Brandon wants to know, what is your definition of a production bloodline? And are you referring to weight of a bird and egg yield? Yes. So. When I say production bloodline, uh, what I'm talking about is a bloodline that has been specifically bred for meat or egg production or both, 
and has been proven for multiple generations. So uh, just because you have a really big bird doesn't necessarily mean its offspring will be for it, uh, big birds. So that I wouldn't call a production bloodline. Um, really the only production bloodlines we sell are the JMF production bloodlines. Uh, we're working on a couple others, but I try to I try to save that type of terminology for uh, bloodlines that are really special um, so that it means something. I, I don't throw it around. Okay, Kelly wants to know, why did you decide to get into JMF and why did you partner with them? Um, so a few things. Uh, if I'm going to breed quail uh, and do it for a living, I want to have the best bloodlines and uh, work with the best people in the industry. So um, that's why we approached JMF. Um, the the JMF bloodline uh, we'll stick with as long as it's the best bloodline. So uh, from everything that we've worked with, um, it's it's kind of the gold standard. So uh, we've been very happy with them, and uh, that's why we started with them. That's why we're still with them, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, we'll keep working with them for a long time. Okay. Brandon says, what does it take to be a partner in the JMF line? Are they still offering partnerships, you know? Um, so they discontinued the mentorship program. Um, I think Robbie's getting close to retirement, um, had some health issues and whatnot. Um, but uh, yeah, to, to be a partner farm, it required going through a mentorship program and being selected uh, by Robbie Richards to be a partner farm. Um, a lot of it comes down to relationships, trust, uh, honesty, and then um, how hard you work at your breeding program. Okay. Uh, Tilapia says, how do you test the genetics of your birds? Do you use a lab? Uh, so we don't normally use a lab for any testing. Uh, we do it the old fashioned way with Mendelian genetic principles. Um, Normally it's just uh, bookkeeping, it's keeping track of what bird produced what, and if you understand genetic inheritance, uh, usually within two generations you can identify almost anything. Um, you have to have a statistically relevant sample size, so you can't just take one or two birds or three birds uh, and make any inferences from that, especially if you don't know the inheritance. Um, but if you see something that's well known, uh, let's say you see a, a Tibetan uh, hatch uh, from an egg, you know that it had uh, two extended brown mutations passed down to it. So just as an example, certain things you know they don't hide, other things do hide, they're recessive, so you really have to do more extensive testing and raise a larger number of birds. Okay. Uh, George says, I'm ready to build my first cage. What's best, all wire or wood and wire? Um, it depends on uh, your climate, what kind of wood. Uh, we like all wire. Um, wood can rot, it can harbor bacteria. Uh, it's difficult to clean. Um, but a lot of people use wood and they're plenty successful with it. If you keep it dry, it's usually fine. Um, things you have to watch out for with <coughs> wire, uh, you don't want it to be too tough on their feet. Um, so if you're using a wire floor, we recommend uh, using a vinyl coated wire floor or at least coating it with a nice thick epoxy layer. Um, that's a lot easier on their feet. If you just want to stick with wire, make sure you give them a dust bath or put some kind of material in the cage so that they can get off the wire uh, or you'll start to see um, issues with their feet. Uh, a lot of times uh, they'll get a small cut, it'll turn into an infection, you'll see swelling, uh, the birds will start limping. Um, but not good for the birds, so keep their feet in good condition if you're using a wire cage. Yep. Uh, just harvest, Katrina says, just harvested for my first time. Once the innards are out, what's a good weight for jumbos at eight weeks? I think she um, says process, process weight. Yeah, so process weight bone in. Um, off the top of my head, I can't tell you exactly, uh, but at eight weeks, those birds should be around uh, 300 grams. So, uh, what's that in ounces? <laughs> about about 50 percent or 60 percent of that is, is what the process weight should be. 
Okay, I'm skipping over some of these questions that have been asked twice or more. Um, David Henry says, we can, question, we can sell eggs, we just can't call them JMF until we are vetted. Uh, did you mention how to get vetted to use that brand? Yeah, we just did that, didn't we? Yep. Uh, okay, Confused says, what's the best meat bird for newbies? Uh, it's easy to start with a Jumbo Brown. Um, the JMF Meat Maker is really popular for beginners. Uh, it's the easiest to raise by far. Um, it's the easiest uh, as far as a, hus a husbandry standpoint. When they're three weeks old, you can identify the males. So if you don't want to have too many males once they hit maturity, it's easy to pull them out. Um, they also are pretty hardy as chicks compared to other bloodlines. Um, but if you are in it just for fun, um, you can play around with some of the other varieties, some of the different plumage colors and whatnot. Um, it just depends on what you want to do. If you're just wanting production, uh, I always recommend starting with Jumbo Browns. Uh, Yeti wants to know if you have any other animals on your farm. Uh, besides us? Um, <laughs> yeah, we have a small flock of uh, guinea fowl that manage our pest population uh, in the compost pile. And then, uh, personally, those are my favorite eggs to eat. So we got some nice free range guinea fowl eggs for the family here. Uh, we've babbled around with other farm animals. We had a horse uh, for a while. We had some ducks. We had some chickens. Um, we uh, just got some sheep, and those are a hoot. Uh, we have some American black billy sheep. I uh, got that as a anniversary gift uh, for my wife. We live on the farm, so it's a, it's a small farm, and it's, a, it's our life right now. So we love the animals. They're a lot of fun. And then I can't forget the farm dogs. We have a bunch of dogs, uh, livestock guardian dogs, um, German Shepherd and Three Pyrenees, and uh, they're great. They love the birds, uh, they love the people, um, and they work really hard. They're, they're pretty amazing. Cool. Brandon wants to know what's your most profitable line or color? Uh, someone's wanting to start a quail farm. Um, the most popular is the Jumbo Browns, uh, if you're wanting to start a business like ours and sell eggs for breeding stock or hatching, um, I don't normally encourage people to do it because there's so many people that do it wrong. Uh, but if you really want to get into it and do it right, um, I would start with those. Uh, it's the biggest market, the most people want them. So they're a, they're a great bird to start with. They're a great only bird if you're just going to have one. Um, they're a rewarding one to raise. Okay. Uh, Kelly wants to know what you got, got you into quail, and is it a family business or a personal endeavor? Um, so it's a family business in the sense that my wife has sacrificed life and limb uh, to help me start the farm. Right. Um, I don't come from a family of uh, farmers. My dad was an electrical engineer, um, and uh, I think we had a rancher way back, great grandparent or something, but no agriculture. So yeah, this is, it's, uh, it piqued my interest. Um, I saw it as a way to do what interests me and do something unique. There's not a lot of things um, that you can uh, do as a career and be the best at. And I thought quail's an emerging market. It's really interesting. Um, I love uh, studying genetics. I love animals and it's something that I really thought uh, I could make an impact in the industry, uh, and um, hopefully we can uh, become a brand name and uh, help a lot of people out for a long time. Okay. Uh, Camilla Quail, tomorrow wants to know, can the few quality jumbo lines now found in Australia be traced back to the JMF lines? No, I don't believe they can. Um, I don't know a lot about Australia genetics, but I know they have some amazing meat lines there. Um, JMF lines that started in the 70s, um, East, East line has a slightly different origin, but I don't think any of them are related to Australian genetics. So most of the bloodlines in the United States are 
from either Canada, Brazil, France, or Egypt. And then recently there's been some imports from Germany. So I, I would suspect that those imports went both directions, but I, I can't tell you for certain. Okay, the McLeod Family Farm says, what's your main goal when breeding your quail and what qualities do you focus on first and foremost? Um, so we have kind of a two-part goal uh, and I'll just answer this specific to our hatching egg business. Um, the main goal is to <coughs> maximize the potential of our breeding stock. So our goals uh, are to make the largest, most efficient egg producer from our egg lines and the largest, most efficient meat producer from our meat lines. Um, and if we can have dual purpose lines, that's an added bonus. Uh, and then our, our secondary goal is to make them accessible uh, to small farms, homesteaders, and commercial farms alike. So we do a lot of business with large commercial farms. Um, we've exported all over the world. And uh, we also do a lot of business with small producers, people who want to order less than 100 eggs. Um, and I think that's great. I think it's a, it's a nice hobby. Uh, it's great when people raise their own food. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to see that market growing. Nice. Uh, Animal wants to know, do you supplement with any vitamins and minerals and have you tried feeding insect larvae? Um, we supplement with all kinds of vitamins and minerals. Uh, we have our feed milled uh, by Purina Mills. So they put whatever we want them to in the feed. We have not tried insect larvae. Uh, insects is the perfect food for quail. It's very rich. If you allow quail to free feed on insects, uh, they'll become morbidly obese very quickly. Uh, they love it. Uh, it's what they would scavenge for in the wild. So if you want to feed them insects, I would say uh, do it in moderation. Uh, we recommend doing it as a treat. Um, if you want to incorporate it into their diet, then make sure that the other things in their diet are not as rich. So you want them to have a balanced diet that's approximately 20% uh, protein as adults. And I think most larvae and most insects are closer to 50. Um, dry weight, that's once they're dehydrated. Obviously, they're mostly water weight uh, as live grubs. But once they're dehydrated and crushed and put into a feed, uh, it's, it's a very rich source of protein. All right, Brandon says, uh, "What do you use as a What do you use as a cage system? Is it custom built or off the shelf?" Um, yeah, it's custom built. So we have a just a standard uh, eight inch tall cage um, with a egg rollout system, automatic waterers, and we hand feed our quail right now. So that ends up taking the longest uh, feeding them and collecting the eggs by hand. <laughs> so someday, someday it'll all be automatic. All right. Uh, how long do you run with a breed or color before you decide if it's a money maker or not? Um, most of our color varieties are not about making money. Um, it's uh, it's something that interests me, and so we keep and maintain a fairly large collection. Uh, most of those we don't have available on our website, but they do end up getting included in our hatcheries of choice. Um, and that's because when you have uh, 50 plus uh, genetic strains, it's it's really difficult to uh, track how productive a small group of birds is and maintain uh, inventory for all of them. So uh, we, we don't tend to offer all of those and a lot of them aren't breeding true yet. So if it's something we're just messing with uh, or experimenting with, um, they'll go into our hatchery's choice uh, variety boxes, but um, I don't like to market things unless I know exactly what they are. So if something doesn't breed through or I don't know what it is, or I don't know what might be in it in two generations, uh, I, I don't usually um, make a product on our website from it. Good practice. Uh, Yeti wants to know how many females to each male bird? Uh, it depends on the bloodline. So there are, are some bloodlines that uh, one male uh, is appropriate for nine or 10 females. Uh, there are other bloodlines where if you raise them in a large colony, you will need one to two. So that's the range um, that we've noticed. We haven't seen anything where you need one to one or where you need more than uh, 10 females per male. But as a general practice, we say start with one to four. 
uh, from any production line or, or any, any other line for that matter, uh, that's a good place to start and then go from there. Perfect. Uh, Grafted Branch Homestead says, I live in New Mexico and my quail are on their way. Did you say you need a permit here? Where do you go about getting it? Um, yeah, so it's going to be from your Game and Fish Department. There are two permits. Uh, they are very, very loosely enforced. So that's, uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. It's uh, <laughs> um, up to everyone to do their, their research for their state. Um, sure. But as, as far as New Mexico, I've personally spoken to the vet there, and they're working to change the laws so that you don't need a permit. So I think uh, as, a, as a good, honest practice, if you want to get your permit and stay in compliance, uh, good on you. Um, they will happily issue you a permit, and it's not very expensive, and they make the process as easy as possible. But if you're in New Mexico and you're raising quail, uh, you don't have to worry about hiding your birds. There's no one that's currently hunting you down. Right. Uh, Brandon says, other than your other than yourself, what other breeders do you recommend? Um, and he also wants to know what's your favorite few. variety. <laughs> oh, um, so going directly to the source is always great if you can manage to get eggs from JMF directly. Um, I don't think he smell, he doesn't sell small quantities and there's usually a bit of a wait to get eggs that way. Um, I recommend the other partner farms for JMF lines. So um, AJ Farms, uh, Anita Garrett in Virginia, and then Naomi Fannin of Kansas City Quail Farm. Um, as far as other breeders that we've worked with that uh, we really like, um, I really like uh, the owner of Gopher Ridge Farms, uh, he's a really great guy, um, so I don't hesitate to recommend them. William Foster has some really interesting genetics, and he's another really great guy. Um, and I've really been impressed with Allie uh, at Maine's Confetti Farm, uh, just the amount of knowledge that she's built up over the last year. Um, really impressive uh, for a color enthusiast and small breeder. So if there's anything that she does that you like, I think uh, you won't go wrong working with her as well. Um, and I know there's others I'm missing. Uh, there's a lot of really great farms out there, um, but those, those are what come to mind at the at the moment. They're really active in the community and um, they're honest about what they sell. So that's the big thing. If, if you order from someone, it's there's nothing worse than hatching out an egg and it's the wrong color uh, or it's not what you ordered. So um, there are farms that do that. There's farms that have uh, five or six different varieties and they're all in the same cage and they try to sell them all individually. And um, Some of them will hatch out what you ordered, but not necessarily all of them, or they run out of eggs, so they put something else in there. Um, it's, it's an industry that has people and people aren't perfect. So any industry we've noticed with people, you have people issues. Okay, uh, is this the family that lives in Louisiana that raises the JMF Faro line? Yes. Oh yep. no, you're not the family, uh, but... <laughs> we're not, so yeah, the original breeders in Louisiana, you know, there's there's some other breeders in Louisiana raising these lines. Um, I'm not familiar with all of them, but uh, no, we're the family in Arizona. Okay. Uh, David says, I want to grow for restaurant and resale. I would like to do the Jumbo White. Do they have the same fast growth rates as Caternix probably does the Jumbos, the Browns? Yep. Okay, let's see. Animal wants to know, do the Whites have a different tasting meat or color than the JMF line? Than the um, no, so you can manipulate uh, meat color and taste with their diet and husbandry, but it's not going to be different based on genetics. Okay. Uh, Shiro, I think that's it is. Uh, I'm from Puerto Rico and I'd like to own quails. Which breed is more resistant to tropical weather? There's a few species that someone has here in Puerto Rico, but I'd like to inform myself. Okay. Okay. Uh, so domestic quail uh, will be Japanese quail. Um, they're fairly good in tropical climates. They're a desert bird, um, but they do well in the tropics as well. Um, as far as which bloodline, uh, if you're in a really, really warm climate, the larger birds are hard to keep cool. 
So I would go with a standard sized bird or a small jumbo if you want to raise me. Uh, I don't know how to say his name. Big 007 says, "How much does your <laughs> JM? How much does your JMF line hatch true?" Uh, so it will always hatch true to the line. Um, approximately 75% or more will reach true jumbo weights, and then as far as colors, you will have a variety of sex link brown and pharaoh, um, but you should not see. Uh, white feather in more than one in every 10,000 birds or so. So if you just order a small batch of eggs, they're all going to hatch out pharaoh or brown. They're all going to look the same when they hatch, maybe some slight differentiation, differentiation in shade, um, but they're going to look like that picture we showed earlier where it's just a bunch of brown birds in a puddle. Um, you're not going to get all the different colors that you see online uh, if you order our production lines. Uh, Animal wants to know, how do you process your birds? Uh, do you have any specialized equipment for plucking? Um, so we don't do any plucking anymore. Um, we are not in that industry. <clears throat> there are some great pluckers. I think Hatching Time makes one uh, or something. Uh, I can't remember the brand name, but um, yeah, expect to spend about 500 to $1,200 on a good plucker. Um, if you want to do a very small operation, there's a farm right plucker that's around $200 that works just fine for two or three birds. Um, and then you want to invest in some kind of a scalding pot. So we recommend the uh, Presto Kitchen Kettle. I think they have a couple sizes. And it's uh, electric, has a built-in thermostat, and uh, you can set that to uh, your desired temperature. We would always, when we're just doing it for personal use, set it to 170 so that we're not having to time the scald and then just scald them for a few seconds and that'll loosen the skin and they pluck really nice by hand after that. Um, cool. But that's a, that's an easy way as a small homesteader. If you want to do a larger operation, then uh, shoot us an email or give us a, uh, reach out to us later and we can uh, walk you through some of that. Okay. All right, it is eight minutes to nine. I'm not going to keep you any longer, um, Michael. We'll, we'll take a couple more questions and then announce our winners. Uh, Berna did have to run, but she texted me the winners, so uh, stick around, right. guys. Um, let me see if I can find some questions that haven't been answered. This is another good one by Brandon. What does it mean if a five-week-old quail doesn't have feathers on its lower back? Um, I've asked that before. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, it can mean a few things. Off the top of my head, uh, they could be plucking those feathers if they're too hot. Um, it could also be early breeding, uh, so especially if they're exposed to constant light or red light. Um, that normally doesn't happen until older. And it's also, um, it's not the first place that they get feathers, so it may just be how they're developing. Um, but if, if they have a large bald spot, that is an issue uh, that should be addressed. So uh, the plumage should, should all be there by five weeks. Okay. Uh, SOS Jones says, hi, Terry and Michael. Just want to let you know that I won the Red German Sparkly Collection eggs last time that you came on. They are beautiful and doing great. Yeah. Awesome. Nice. Okay. Oh, and the bald spot on the back could be a nutritional issue of some sort. So they don't have constant access to feed or they have a low quality feed. Uh, that could lead to that as well. <clears throat> I've only had that happen once and it turned out that I had way too much heat on the birds for too long. And uh, yeah, they just didn't feather out right. Okay. Tomorrow wants to know how hard is it to get NPIP certified? Uh, it's not terribly hard. It depends on your state. So if you're in a poultry friendly state, they will do everything for you. Uh, they'll show up and you'll be done in a matter of an hour or two. Um, they'll do all the testing, they'll bring everything, uh, and they'll, they'll have your certification mailed uh, a few weeks later. If you work in a less poultry friendly state, um, you will have to purchase all the equipment yourself. Uh, you will need to 
schedule the date with them and get them to come out to your place. Uh, they'll inspect it. They'll probably educate you and walk you through uh, the testing process. And uh, every state's a little different. So just reach out to your NVIP OSA and uh, see what the process is. I know in our state, um, the initial investment is around $400. And uh, they come out and do everything from there. All right, last question uh, we're going to take here is from Doc Holliday. It says, how does the JMF compare to the MyShire Jumbo Wild? When introducing new blood to the JMF, do you recommend any farms or lines that you know would mix well with the JMF meat makers? Um, I've never done a direct comparison between our stock and MyShire. I uh, haven't ordered their stock. Um, I am familiar with the origins of it, so I can say they're not terribly different genetically, um, as long as uh, my shire has um, not mixed anything with them. So, if you're wondering which is better, I would suggest just ordering a test batch of each and raising them yourself and keeping whichever one you like more. Um, there's not really anything else uh, you can do other than asking people who have personal experience with their birds um, and also have personal experience with ours. So, a lot of times. Uh, one person may order and then not raise them properly, and then someone else may order from a different farm and raise them properly, and you won't get an apples to apples comparison. So that's a that's a tricky one. Okay. All right, guys. Um, sorry we weren't able to get to all your questions, um, but we are running pretty late tonight. Two hour show tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, announce the winners. And if you winners will uh, um, email me your shipping information to terry at turnixcorner.com. Um, I will make sure that Michael gets the information for the eggs. And uh, obviously I'll get the information for the cups. So the winner of the eggs is Grafted Branch Homestead. Um, All right. I hope you're still in here. I don't need to write it down because it's here on my text. I'm just seeing if he's still in there. Um, but yeah, if you would, email me your information, and I will make sure that Michael gets that. And the winner of the the mug is Brandon PC Brew. And I don't remember if Brandon won a mug yet or not. So, Brandon, if you already won, let me know, and we'll see if we can come up with something else. But both of you guys, um, send me your shipping information, and we'll make sure that gets out to you as soon as possible. So, guys, I want to thank everybody who uh, um, checked in tonight and set a uh, question for Michael. We really appreciate it. Michael, I really want to thank you for coming on again to the show. Um, great information, as always. It's great coming on. I really like what you're doing with the community here. Yeah, and, and you're always welcome. So anytime you want to come on, let me know. So, guys, uh, have a great night. Like I say, I don't know if I'm going to be going live next Tuesday. Uh, if I am, you'll hear about it over on Facebook. So just check there. So everyone else, have a great night, and we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot, Michael. All right. Take care.